This is the Anthony Towns, right? We want to send you our condolences for your passing of your dad, but we know he's in a better place. He's my little buddy. Hi. He always waves to me in the morning. God bless you. Yeah, we want to send our condolences to you and your family, but we know he's in a better place, and he's preparing the table for the coming of the Lord. He's up there saying, don't mourn for me because I'm in a happy place. Amen? And uh, we need to catch up to him, right? He's already there. And the Bible says we'll be gathered together in the air. So God bless you this morning. Uh, I want to share with you this morning a, a subject that's very, very been on my heart for a while, um, of what I see going on. And, and I know your husband does too. He sees a lot that's going on. And we have a good kindred spirit together. And, um, but uh, something that I've been noticing that's happening in the church that so many Christians are unaware of what's going on. I don't know if you, un if you know this or not, but there is also what's called the angel board that's being sold to Christians. It's exactly like a Ouija board. And you contact your angels uh, through this board, and many churches are adopting it. Many churches are getting into it. Uh, it's just it's horrible what's, gonna, what's taking place. And uh, not only that, but there's also uh, teams, what they call, uh, um, uh, what do they call it? Uh, seeing teams in churches that are being set up. It comes out of Australia. It's amazing some of the things that are coming out of Australia. And these teams, they go to churches, and they have card readings. They replace the tarot cards with different uh, uh, pictures on it, and they're reading uh, people's destinies. And they're telling people it's all occultic. But that's some of the stuff that's going out there, so don't fall for any of that stuff. Then I started thinking about the churches and how churches are going and what directions they're going and why they're going in the directions they're going. And... Uh, I found that the, the message I want to share with you today is the falling away. The falling away. Now, how many of us know that in the last days, God's word says that there's going to be a great falling away, that many shall fall away from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils? Just put up uh, 2 Thessalonians 2.3 uh, for a moment, I believe it is. Yep, 2.3. Put that up there for a moment, and let's just open a prayer as he's doing that. Father... We thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you, Father, for your mercy and your grace and, and for your comfort that you comfort our hearts in times of sorrow. God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit being here today and doing all of those things that you want to accomplish in and, of, in and, and through us today. Father, thank you for your word that's always anointed. There's not a time it's not anointed. It's always anointed. And Father, we ask that you would just anoint these uh, lips of clay this morning that, God, your message will go forth and accomplish that which you want to accomplish this morning. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen, Amen. It says here, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin re revealed, the son of perdition. We know who that is. That is the Antichrist. We understand that. We know that. But the thing that I want to concentrate on is the falling away part. Now, we know we're coming close to the coming of the Lord. And if we're coming close to the coming of the Lord, we also know that we're coming close to the time that the Antichrist will be revealed. And we believe just before that re revelation of, of, his, of who he is, we'll be raptured in the rapture. We believe that here. Amen. So, again, I want to focus on the falling away part. And as I was reading the scriptures, God was showing me, uh, in the scriptures, that there are two priesthoods. There's the Zadok priesthood, and there's the Abathar priesthood. And these two priesthoods are very much alive today. You can see them active in many churches today. And we're going to do a comparison of those two. And um, first and foremost is, is the Zadok priesthood, the Zadok priesthood. The Zadok priesthood is a priesthood that follows all the way through and continues on even to this day. And the, the word Zadok means one who is righteous, one who has been proven righteous. I'll give you a little bit of background about uh, him. and uh, that He was a high priest uh, serving David at the time. And there was another high priest by the name of Abatha. Now, Abatha means that he is a person of influence. Person of influence. 
And these were two high priests that were serving during the time of David. Now, to kind of give you a little background history on this, Abathar was one that was serving uh, under Saul when Saul was king. And what was happening during that time, as King, as king Saul started to move away from the Lord, the anointing began to move away. And as the anointing began to move away, and, they, and Saul was seeing that David was the anointed one, that David was going to be king, jealousy filled Saul's heart, and he began to pursue David to kill him. And what happened was when, uh, when uh, Saul got wind of that, that, he, that uh, David was in a certain place, he had gone to try to kill him. And you know the story, David went into the cave and cut a piece off of his robe and said, look, if I want to kill you, I could have killed you, but your God's anointed, I'm not going to touch you. So he was infuriated with that, and of course, you know, he went to the witch of Endor, and I'm trying to give you all of the background information. So during this time, uh, when uh, Abathar was with Saul, he saw that the anointing had left Saul, and so when Saul began to kill all of the high priests and Nob, uh, Abathar was the only one that escaped. He's the only one that escaped, and he, he ran to David. David received him because he had the ephod, and the ephod was there to interpret the will of God for David. And so now Abathar is with David, and so is um, um, uh, Zadok with David. So that's kind of the little background there. But something took place, and you have to understand where these two lines come from. Zadok comes from the, line, the lineage of Aaron, and Abathar comes from the lineage of Eli. You know the story of Eli. He was a high priest, and he had two sons, Nadab and Abihu. And in those two sons, they didn't really serve the Lord with all of their heart. They, they compromised. Uh, they were doing all kinds of immorality in the church, uh, in, the, uh, in the service of God back then. Uh, and the thing about Eli was he never reproved his kids. He never disciplined them. He never told them. He just said, what are you doing? But he never, never did anything about it. So Abathar was his son also. Okay? So we see that he comes from the line and the lineage of Eli. Now, because Eli did those things, what happened, what ended up happening was he got cut off from serving the Lord. You can go back and you can read all these stories in 1 Kings and and Samuel, he got to, his whole lineage got cut off. But let me say this. They only got cut off from serving, but they still served. He was a compromising person. At the same time Zadok was serving, Abathar was serving with him. Now, when he was serving together with David, he was fine. But now there came somebody along named Adonijah. Now, Adonijah was one other son of David. He was the elder son of David. Okay? And now, Adonijah means, listen to this now, Adonijah means success and prosperity. And in 1 Kings chapter 5, I believe it is, in verse 1, king, uh, Adonijah says this, I will be king. Now, that wasn't up to him. That was up to David. David was on his deathbed. He was dying. And, then the, and a lot of people thought Solomon was going to be the king. And Adonijah says, no, I'm going to be king. So there's a self-exaltation there of someone who is not called to be king, but someone who appointed themselves to be king. Okay? So what happened was Adonijah, along with the general Joab, and you know who Joab was. Joab is the one that killed Saul. Okay? Joab goes and aligns himself to Adonijah. But so does Abathah. He aligns himself up with Adonijah. Then David says, let me call Nathan and Zadok together. And he calls them together and he says, listen, go anoint, go anoint Solomon king. Go anoint Solomon king. What's that got to do with anything? Well, let me tell you this. That ministry of compromise is in existence today. You are either sitting under an Abatha priesthood or you're sitting under a Zadok priesthood. You're either sitting under one or the other. One 
is one who is not afraid to deal with sin, not afraid to deal with issues that will confront you about your sin, will confront, about, confront you about your, your situations, or you'll be the, with the Abathah that just lets everything go and just compromises. Don't we see that in the church today? We see that terribly today. We see that terribly. So in, uh, first of all, we'll talk about Z Zadok for a moment. He was a descendant of Aaron, and he was a co-priest with Abathah, as we discussed. And they were loyal to David to that one point until Adonijah decided that he wanted to be the king in Israel. Zadok remained faithful to David, and he turned away from Adonijah. There are a lot of Adonijahs in the ministry. There are a lot of um, Abathahs in the ministry today. And the Abathahs in the ministry today are only out to feed themselves. Remember Eli and his sons? They said, when you go, take the hook and throw it into the pot. Whatever comes up, you take it. They didn't want that. They wanted the best of everything. Adonijah means success and prosperity. Look what Abathah was going after. He was going after success and prosperity. He was leaving the royal calling of God under the direction of David and Solomon, now Solomon, and because he rebelled and he went with, he went with uh, Adonijah, Solomon said, now no more. Go back to your home. You're no longer going to serve the Lord. But he still did serve the Lord, but not in the same capacity. Same way with a lot of churches today that are rising up. You're seeing these churches come, and they got all the programs. they got all the people. they got everything in sight. God hasn't called them, okay, but man has appointed them. And what's happening is people are getting caught up and not discerning because there's no discernment. And they see the apathy come along and, and they see the prosperity and the success and they run to this prosperity and success churches and they're leaving churches that are good, solid, foundational churches that are teaching doctrine, that are teaching the things of God in the right way. But all of this, all of this is for a reason. Turn with me for a moment to the book of Ezekiel. You heard the term seek a friendly church. You heard the term lukewarm church. Churches today that have hundreds, if not thousands, of people sitting in them. Can I tell you that a lot of those people are not saved? I know a woman that goes to it. Uh, she's a distant cousin of mine, and she goes to a church in, in Texas, big church. I could tell you the name. You know who the pastor is on television, has all kinds of stuff on it. Been going to that church for almost three years. She says she's a Christian. So I, t I messaged her back on Facebook. I said, it's great to connect with you again. How are you? Blah, blah, blah. You know, small talk. And then I said to her, I see that you're a Christian. When were you born again? And she wrote back and said, what's that mean? Because people associate being a Christian with church and affiliation. Not a, not a regeneration, not, a, not a, 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 a relationship with Jesus Christ, but a church affiliation, a denominational affiliation. And this church has 20,000 people in it or more. But that's what's happening. See, the church today that's preaching the unadulterated word of God, people don't want it. The majority of them. My Bible talks to me about a remnant. My Bible tells me that in the last days, many shall fall away from the faith 
My Bible tells me that many are going to go down the wide road and many there go in there at, but narrow is the way and few there be that find it. And that's why if you're in a church that's preaching the truth of God's word, don't leave it for something that looks better on the outside. Let's look in Ezekiel chapter 44 for a moment. Listen to this. Start with verse 5. And the Lord said unto me, Son of man, mark well, notice that, mark well, and behold with thy eyes, and hear with thy ears all that I say unto thee concerning all the ordinances of the house of the Lord, and all the laws thereof, and mark well, there's that phrase again, mock well. The entering in of the house. God has a protocol, if you will. Now, I know that some of you probably travel, like Joe, you travel to London and everything. When you're in there, do you just go up to the gate and say, hey, I want to see the queen? Not going to happen. There's a protocol you need to follow. Okay, You can't just go up to the White House and say, hey, I want to go talk to Trump. Not going to happen. There's a protocol you have to follow. It's the same way with the kingdom of God. How have we made the house of God so lukewarm? We made the house of God something that you just come in. It's just a building. Just come in and just sit and go through the motions. No. There's a protocol that God has. Look what he says here. The entering in of the house with every going forth of the sanctuary. Look at this as verse 6. And thou shalt say to the rebellious. Didn't know there was rebellious people in God's house, did you? Thou shalt say to the rebellious, even to the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, O ye house of Israel, let it suffice you of all your abominations. What's God doing here, dealing with this house? The Bible says judgment will begin in the house of God. And if it begins with us, what's going to be the end result of those that are without? We're living in the last days, and we don't believe it. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. But if we do believe it, we'll act like we believe it. We'll be making changes in our life to show that we believe it. It's not just something that we've accepted as a truth, and done nothing about it. Do you understand when we say the coming of the Lord is near and Jesus is coming soon, does that create an urgency in you to go tell your loved ones and your daughters and your sons and your, and your cousins and your aunties and your uncles and your moms and your dads that God's wrath is about to be poured out upon this earth? It's serious business. It's not about just telling somebody to come to church. It's about sharing with them what's going to happen and that they can escape the wrath of God by receiving Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. He says, look, what it suffices you of all your Israel abominations. What were the abominations? What were these priests allowing to happen? What were these ministers allowing to happen in the house of God? This isn't my house. This isn't your house. This is God's house. Now, I understand the scripture that says he doesn't dwell in houses made with hands. I understand that. But his presence is among us. It's not the building. It's us. But look what he says in verse 7. In that you have brought into my sanctuary strangers, uncircumcised in heart, and uncircumcised in flesh, to be in my sanctuary, to pollute it. Even my house. Wow. There 
about priests today, and I'm not talking Catholic priests. I'm talking about ministers today. They're allowing all kinds of sexual sin into their church. Drunkenness. People living together, doing all kinds of things. And the ministers love to have it so because they want their money. They don't want to lose the tithe and the offering. God is putting an indictment on these preachers. And he's telling them how you have become an abomination to me by you allowing the strangers that are uncircumcised in their heart to come into my house. This is not a popular message. And uncircumcised in flesh... The heart is the motives. The flesh is the doing part. Uncircumcised in flesh. They haven't been cut in the flesh. They haven't been cut to the point where they have repented and said, God, change me. He says, even in my house when you offer my bread, the fat of the blood, and they have broken my covenant because... Of all your abominations. This is the Abatha ministry. This is the followers of Adonijah. For success and prosperity. They're willing to forsake the truths of God's word. For the sake of success and prosperity before men. Look at what the Bible says in Revelation about a church. They said we are rich and in need of nothing. They had all the programs. They had everything that man could want. They had their coffee shops and their donut shops and their sandwich shops right in the church. They could buy and sell whatever they wanted to. In fact, there was a time when God's house was so polluted that Jesus himself. Now, I know a lot of people would say Jesus needed to go to anger management because he couldn't handle his anger. Because he went into God's house and he began to whip people. Think about this. This is Jesus, you know, loving Jesus, loving Jesus. No, we love Jesus. Goes into his house, father's house, and he begins to whip people. Turn over tables and chairs. And say, you have made my father's house a den of thieves. And it's supposed to be a house of prayer. But the Abathar ministry and the, the Adonijah ministry is only worried about success and prosperity. They're allowing these abominations into the house of God. And they're doing nothing about it. Look at verse 8. He says, And you have not kept the charge of my holy things, but you have set keepers of my charge in my sanctuary for yourselves. They surround themselves with people that are in agreement with them. Hello? We don't always have to agree. But we can not be disagreeable. There are some things we can stand our ground on and have our convictions on, and there's other things that we can kind of say, okay, well, you know, we, don't, we can have a difference of opinion on that. It's not going to send us to hell. But they put people in charge for themselves. And they take away those who are looking for the Adonijah ministry. Because of the covetousness of their heart. They want the prosperity and the success of ministry at any cost. 
Let me tell you, one of the personality traits, we all have personality traits, but one of the strong personality traits says this, that it doesn't matter what you do, it's the end result that matters. Some people will do all kinds of dishonest things. Does it matter as long as the end result, they get what they want? And it happens in ministry. When I go to these places and I go to these conferences and I speak at these conferences to ministers, I tell them, your character and your integrity can never be restored or replaced. That's something that's sacred. Don't give in to those things. Keep a higher ethical standard. We're supposed to. But can I tell you that position is not very well loved. You'll have people that will mock you, call you legalistic, call you all kinds of names. That's because they don't know their Bible. I don't want to be an Abathah ministry. I don't want to be an Adonijah ministry. I want to be of the, the priesthood of the Zadok. One that was faithful, proved to be righteous. How did he prove to be righteous? Because when Adonijah was raising himself up to be king and Abathah just went along with it, Zadok didn't. He had character and integrity and he said, no, the anointing is not on the success and the prosperity. The anointing is on who God puts it. So he stayed with David. Verse 9 says, Thus says the Lord God, No stranger, uncircumcised. Now, this is God speaking. This is not a board of elders, a board of deacons. This is not a denomination. And while I'm speaking on denomination, let me just clue you in on something that I just found out. One of the largest Pentecostal denominations in the United States and in the world just made a mandate to all of their churches in their morning services, don't allow speaking in tongues anymore. It might offend somebody. Only speak it at the night services. They're telling the Holy Spirit when to manifest. A major Pentecostal denomination is now telling their people, don't speak in tongues in the mornings, don't allow it. They're grieving the Spirit. They're quenching the spirit so they don't offend somebody. Well, what's next? The cross? What's next? The pulpit? Because someone's offended? The Bible, my Bible says the cross is an offense. Christianity is an offense to the devil. He hates the cross. He hates Christianity. He hates the blood of Jesus. So what are they going to do? Try to control our thinking and our talk now? It tells us we can't talk about the blood because it's offensive? There's a whole school that changed their name because of the name Zion offended people. They changed the name. When, when I found out, I said to the person that was telling me, this, one of the students, I said, you mean they changed the name from Zion? To North Point? I'll say it, North Point. What's next? Jesus? That offends? We're going to change that name too? God says this. Not me. Thus says the Lord God, no stranger uncircumcised in heart nor uncircumcised in flesh shall enter into my sanctuary or any stranger that is among the children of Israel. Why? Because they'll pollute it. What did Paul say? He brought it up to the church era. He said, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Come on. I mean, if you want to talk about a mega church, Jesus had the first mega church that ever existed. He fed 5,000 and he fed 4,000. He had 9,000 people following him. Think about it. Not counting his disciples and all the other stragglers that were along with him. 
But let me ask you this question. When the rubber hit the road and he was in the garden of Gethsemane, how many stood with him? None. They followed him for the loaves and fishes, for success and prosperity. Let me tell you, it's alive and well in New Testament times. It's alive and well in our times that there are Abathar ministries, there are Andonijah ministries that have set themselves up. And they are allowing the uncircumcised in heart and flesh to come into the sanctuary. And their thinking is, well, there's, you gotta, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, God will convict them in time. No! Well, they say, well, when are people supposed to get saved? I say, you're supposed to go tell them. Amen. Jesus didn't give the great commission and say, come into the church and preach the gospel. Did he? What did he tell his disciples? To go, all, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Build up a relationship with someone outside of church. Get them saved. Lead them to Jesus. The pastor doesn't have to lead them to Jesus. You can lead them to Jesus. And then when Jesus gets inside of them, they're going to desire and say, where do you go to church? Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. It's 75 in here. Ooh. I'm still wearing the priestly outfit. You don't see me with holy jeans and shirt untucked and sleeves rolled up. and That's what it's come to. And, of course, I know the people say, oh, you're just religious. I said, no, I'm not religious. I said, well, you call the Levites religious, wouldn't you? The Bible says that they weren't to mix their wool with anything. They were supposed to wear special outfits when they were present, present to serve the Lord. Come on, somebody. That mixture is not just in the clothes, you know. They're not supposed to be in mixture. Allowing all kinds of things in your life. Come on, somebody. Your pastor's not supposed to have four wives. Come on, somebody. It's the truth. I heard a story of a pastor. He was, he was in his office, and a woman came in, and he was by himself in his office, and she came in, and she had a long coat on, you know, and she came in and she said, I need to have counseling. He, she wasn't part of his church. And uh, he said, well, what do you need? She says, this is what I need. She opened her coat and she was totally naked. Come on. How many know the devil put traps in your way? One way to get rid of a, a woman that does that to you as a minister, you know what you do? When they do that to you, you just say, boy, you're getting fat. <laughs> She'll storm right out of there. Come on. That's one sure way to get rid of them. And the Levites, oh, let me finish that verse. It says, Shall I enter my sanctuary any stranger that is among the children of Israel? And the Levites that are gone away far from me, when Israel went astray, which went astray from me after their idols, they shall even bear their iniquity. Yet they shall be ministers in my sanctuary. Look at that. Yet they will, shall be ministers in my sanctuary. It's still going to go on, folks. That ministry's still going on. 
to the end of time. Come on, somebody. It's going on even in our day. Anyone today can be a pastor. I'm serious. Anyone today. There was a, a pastor on Facebook that was spreading hate to, to Donald Trump in her town. She's a reverend, quote, unquote. Saying, you're not welcome here. Hater, hater, you're not welcome here. Let these people grieve because he went to the synagogue to console the, the Jewish people that lost their life. Because he has, he has relatives that are Jewish. And he goes there to bring a, you know, a word of comfort to them and, and just to, sh to tell them that we're thinking of you as a nation. And here's this woman preacher standing up saying, you're not welcome here. This is our street. This is some squirrel something or other place that they live in, a squirrel view uh, town or whatever it is. So I said, you're a squirrel nutcase. I said, you don't even be, belong behind the pulpit. I said, yeah, you got a sign, we don't welcome hate here, but you're spewing it out. They're blind. Thou art unexcusable, old man, Romans says, for when you accuse someone else, you do the very same thing. Come on, somebody. Yet you shall be ministers of my sanctuary, having charge at the gates. The gates of a place is where the elders would gather together to make judgment. And I tell you, that's what's happening. They're affecting leaders. I've been reading about uh, different ministries that, you know, the pastor is, is uh, trying to raise somebody up and, and the, this, the person will come in and they'll sit under them and, and they're like an Abatha. They're right. They're, in the beginning, they're right. But there's something inside of them that's not settled. Something that has not been dealt with by God. And they have this uh, unharnessed ambition. Ambition's good, but it can kill you. Look at Absalom, David's son, his other son. He wanted that kingship so bad that he was willing to kill his father. That's ambition. Ambition with the wrong intent. We know what happened to Absalom. In fact, when I was in Israel, I saw Absalom's tomb. He's still in there. There'll be ministers in my sanctuary. They'll have charge at the gates of the house. And ministering to the house, they will slay the burnt offering and the sacrifice of the people, and they shall stand before them to minister unto them. In other words, business as usual. Business as usual. The Abathah ministry, business as usual. They're not going to cut them off completely. He says, in fact, uh, Solomon says, the right arm is going to be cut off, meaning the authority. But they're right on, keep on going, right in business. People look at churches today that have 800, 1,000 people in them, 2,000 people in them, and say, well, that's got to be God. And here we have men that have toiled over years, paid the price, like your husband. Sold and sold and sold. And these little fly-by-night ministries come out, and in, within five years, they got got 1,000 people. And everybody says, oh, that's God. Is it? Is it really? I could fill this place up like this if I become an Abathah. If I have an Abathah ministry, just let anything slide, anything go by, ordain anybody. You're going to go on as usual, Mama. You're going to just keep going on and on and on. Now 
Now look at verse 12. Because they ministered unto them before their idols. There's nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. What did Aaron do when Moses was up in the mountain? Seeking God, getting the Ten Commandments. And it didn't come back in the time allotment that he thought he should come back in. And the people said to Aaron, make us a God that we can worship. Can I tell you, the people in the world today are saying the same exact thing. Make us a God that we can worship. They don't want the God of the Bible. They don't want the God that demands holiness and righteousness. They want a God that will appease them and conform to them rather than they conforming to him. That's called religion. Hello? Hello? Everyone know who Anton LaVey is? Anton LaVey is, he was, he's dead now. But he was a Satanist priest in San Francisco. The Church of Satan wrote the Satanic Bible. You know what he said? This is what, these are his words. I'm going to tell you what he said. He said, I'm very thankful that Christians let their kids worship Satan on Halloween. He said that. An occultist. He said, I'm glad that Christians allow their kids to worship Satan one day out of the year. Because people don't know what Halloween means. Oh, it's just innocent. You know, little kids in candy and costume. No, it's not innocent. It's the highest holy day of Satanism. They worship God before their idols. There are things in their life that are more important to them than God. And that's an idol. And they are operating in the sanctuary. God help us. Ministering to the house, they shall slay the burnt offerings, the sacrifice of the people, and they shall stand before them to minister to them. Because they minister to them before their idols and cause the house of Israel to fall into iniquity. Therefore, I have lifted up my hand against... Ooh. Imagine God lifting his hand against you. That should send a shiver of fear in your bones to have the hand of God raised against you. Saith the Lord, and they shall bear their iniquity. He's talking to the leaders here now. Come on. He's talking to the, the pastors, the preachers. He's because you're, you, you're serving me, but you're serving me before the people, before your idols. I hope this brings a revolution to the church of God. Next verse. And they, here's the important part. Let me tell you something. When ministers are ministering, they're not ministering to you, they're ministering to God. You get the benefit of it. You get fed. But they're doing it as a service to God. They're serving God. That's why you can't have an idol. That's why you can't serve God before idols. Come on, somebody. And they shall not come near unto me to do the office of a priest unto me, not to come near to any of my holy things in the most holy place. Can I tell you? They are visionless. And they have no revelation of who God is. You look at the worship today. I'm just going to pull a song out of, out of my repertoire in my head, okay? And churches sing it all over the place. I am a friend of God. It's a true song. It ain't worship, though. What's that got to do with worshiping God? I'm a friend of God. He knows my name. So? 
So? That's not worshiping God. Worshiping God is when you tune yourself in and, and, you, and in your spirit you begin to worship Him and praise Him and lift Him up because He deserves it. Because of who He is. It's not about singing about you and your benefits. That's not worship. That could be a praise song. That's okay. You want to sing a praise song? That's fine. But don't call it worship because it's not worship. It's about you. Come on, somebody. It's getting quiet in here. Come on, don't shout me down now. But look what else it says. But they shall bear their shame and their abominations which they have committed. There's going to be a payday. Come on. There's going to be a payday. Verse 14. But I will make them keep, look at this, but I will make them keepers of the charge of the house for all the, the service thereof and for all that shall be done therein. But look what happens. That's to the Abathah Eli ministry. But look at the next verse. But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, Zadok meaning he who has proved righteous. Whew. I just got a wave of the glory, brother. They that have been proven righteous, those who have not given in, those who stayed the steadfastness of the Lord and didn't give in to the ways and the mechanisms of man. Come on, somebody. There was a preacher who went on the radio and he said, uh, to try to fill his church up, you know, he said to them, he said, because uh, he didn't think anybody would come. He said, I'm going to give $10 to the first 100 people that come. A thousand people showed up. I don't know how much money he had to pay out. Did they come back? No. Come on, if I put a sign out or I put an ad in the Standard Times and I say, this Sunday after service, but you've got to come to the service, after service I'm going to be serving lobster and prime rib. Free. You wouldn't have a seat in this place. He said, my people love to have it so. But the Levites, the sons of Zadok, the ones that were proven righteous. Your husband and your husband and others that God has that have not bowed their knee to Baal. Come on. That takes the ridicule. Takes the laughing at. Takes the pointing of the finger. You're a religious. You're a legalist. I just want it done right. Since when did we give up on the instructions? Since when did we give up on the instructions? But we allow more things than God's word allows. And now God's calling for the priests. I told you, judgment's going to begin at the house of God. I'm telling you this right on Facebook right now, well, because we're live. I'm telling you right now, judgment's going to begin with the Abathar and the Zadok ministry. So you better be prepared. And if you are one of the Abathars, the Lord's hand is against you. I had a preacher one time tell me we, were, we had a preacher's prayer meeting and he, we were talking, you know, about different things. And he says, oh, he says, uh, homosexual people, they're allowed in my church. They can sit as long as they want to. I felt like saying to him, but I had to hold my tongue because I'm like Peter. Ah. I had to hold my tongue and say, that's because the anointing's not there. Because if the Holy Ghost is there, the Bible says that he came to convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. If the Holy Spirit's there, this should be that in operation. I had one person come to me one time and said, 
I told him something. He said, I'm going to, I feel like punching you right in the face. You know what I told him? I said, you do that, God will kill you. I don't have to raise a hand to you. I had witches put curses on me. I had four witches come to my door when we were on the other building over there and, and curse that door and curse that, that place. You know the story. I was preaching one Sunday. I felt like I was having a heart attack. And I said, oh, God. I said, congregation prays. And I had a woman that was there. Her son was the high Satanist priest, witch in Salem. God says, you got, he's, he's channeling through his mother to you. I said, we're going to pray. We pray. I said, I bind this prayer. I said, Lord Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Now, those of you that know, I'm telling you the truth. I said, if that man you know in your divine providence and wisdom will never repent of his sin, then let what comes on me go on him. He was 41 years old. Two weeks later, on a Sunday morning, he died of a massive heart attack. Never saw the mother again. Let me tell you, there are enemies to the cross of Christ. That's how I pray. Lord, if there are enemies to the cross of Christ, you know they're never going to be saved, get them out. Remove them. You can't. When the hand of God is against you, ooh, wait a minute. when the hand of God is against you, woo! For the priests of the Levites, the sons of Zadok, that kept the charge of my sanctuary. Look at that. They kept it. They kept the charge of my sanctuary. When the children of Israel went astray from me. In other words, they didn't go chasing after them. Oh, you're leaving my church. Oh, don't leave my church. Come on, I'll change. I won't preach that anymore. <laughs> the children of Israel went astray, but the leadership of Zadok didn't go astray. They weren't concerned about the amount of people that were in their congregation. They weren't concerned about the success and prosperity of ministry. They kept the charge of his sanctuary. When the children of Israel went astray, he said, from me. Whew. They shall come near to me. Look at this, the Zadok priesthood. They shall come near to me, God, to minister unto me. God says they're going to come and they're going to minister unto me. Those other ones, the Abathah ministry and the Ad Adonijah ministry, they're not ministering to me. They're, they're heaping it up for themselves. They will come, these Zadok priests, they're going to come near to me, to minister to me, and they shall stand before me to offer me the fat and the blood, saith the Lord God. Hallelujah. I'm going to finish up, I promise. Look at this, verse 16. They shall enter into my sanctuary. Whew. Divine permission. They will enter my sanctuary and they shall come near to my table. The psalmist said it this way. The Lord will prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Come on. Hallelujah. They shall enter into my sanctuary and they shall come near to my table to minister unto me and they shall keep my charge in verse 23 I'm going to close I could go on and on and on and on and on the Zadok priesthood listen to me the Zadok priesthood will teach you the difference between the holy and the profane. And cause them to discern 
between the unclean and the clean. That's the Zadok priesthood ministry. You may not like it sometime. You may not want to hear it sometime. But when a, a Zadok priest comes to you and says, I got something to tell you. I want to share something with you. Not in a condemnation way, but in a restoration way. He's going to teach you the difference between holy and profane. I'm going to tell you this. I don't know if I told you this. I don't remember. I'm getting old. We had somebody working with us in ministry. <clears throat> Started a program, an outreach program. We're going to have hundreds of youth gathered together from all different states. We're going to have people come by the bus loads. And I agreed to it. And then one night, God woke me up in the middle of the night. And he spoke this scripture to me. Right there. And he said these words, separate me, the holy from the profane. I'm like, God, what does that mean? He says, stop that program. So I told this person, the next day, I called them and I said, listen. I said, this is what happened to me last night. God woke me up in the middle of the night, spoke to me. I know, the God's, I know God's voice. He said, stop the program. Well, he cried and got all upset. And he said, all the work that I did, and I called in favors. And I said, give me the telephone numbers. I'll call them. I'm not afraid to put it on me. Because I'm going to obey God rather than man. So anyway, he got upset, and he stayed for a little while, and then he ended up leaving, starting his own ministry. Two years go by. Listen to me now. Two years go by. Never knew why God told me to do that. I just obeyed. I get a phone call from a brother who goes to a church in this area, and he says, can you meet with me and my pastor? I said, sure. So I went over to the house. This brother was the main speaker of that event that was going to take place in our church. I said, okay, brother, I'll meet you. This way. I went there. He sat there. He says, pastor, he said, I want you to know something. He said, I haven't told you this. He said, you didn't know this. He said, but you know I was the main speaker at the outreach that so-and-so, I'm not going to mention his name, was given. He said, I was the main speaker. I said, yeah. I said, I knew that. He said, but the thing you didn't know was, he says, I was hooked on pornography. And I was, I was using pornography at that time. He said, when God told you to separate the profane from the holy, you were right on. You heard from God. He said, I came here tonight to repent before my pastor and before you. But I'm going to tell you, I had people in this church question me about that. I had people tell me, oh, I had someone, someone told him in this, con not, not now, but someone had told him that if I can't handle the things in this church, I cancel it. If I can't, can't get my hands on it, I cancel it. Wrong! If God's hand can't be on it, it's canceled. And I said that to share this scripture to let you know that this is not something theological that I'm preaching to you this morning. This is something that's real, that has happened in my life and in my ministry. I was ridiculed. I was accused. I, could, I still got the emails. I could show it to you, but I'm not going to. The things that he called me and Mama. But you want to know what? The Zadok ministry is still here. The Abatha ministry is gone. He's not even pastoring here anymore. Come on, somebody. Give me an amen. Because I want to do it God's way. Do I do everything right? No, sometimes I make a mistake.
but I'm quick to make it right. We've given money to Pakistan to start a church, and they were thieves. He was so excited, he's going to start a forest glory Christian assembly in Pakistan. We were, we were like, all right, yes, Lord, we're going to start planting churches. Good. Got to talk with him a little bit, share with a little bit about him, and he found some things that were not quite right. And then I said, well, you're not allowed to use our name. You're not allowed to use our church affiliation, nothing like that. Uh, he, he promised to return the money. Hasn't come yet. Won't come either. But I said all that to say this because he said to me, he said, I'll prove to you when we have a big ministry. I'll prove to you. I wrote him back. You know what I wrote him? What God told me to tell him. No, I gave him scripture. Not my opinion. I said, not all that say unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but they that do the will of my Father. But they shall say to me in that day, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we do healings and miracles and cast out devils? And Jesus didn't say, oh, great, come on in. But guys, I missed you. No, he said, depart from me. I never knew you. And I never heard of him since. Separate the holy from the profane. I like what Brother David Diamond said. I'll close for the third time. When he was, back, when he was, his wife was backslidden, they got together and they were married. And she gave her heart to God. She was in a parking lot somewhere. And uh, David was making fun of her, making fun of the church, you know. He says, you know, I was in their church, all speaking tongues. Woo, woo, woo. They were making all kinds of crazy noises and stuff. She said, David, don't make fun of my religion. She said, David, I love you. And I remember these words. She said, David, I love you and I'll always love you. But tonight I'm giving my heart back to Jesus. And this is what the words that she said that God spoke to him and, and got him, got his attention. Because you cannot serve God and be in the world, you'll go to hell. And then he heard a voice behind him. Verbally, he says, I heard a verbal voice behind me say, my son, what she tells you is the truth. Make up your mind. You going to make up your mind this morning? What type of ministry you want to be a part of? God knows everything. He knows the thoughts and intents of hearts. He knows all that kind of stuff. My prayer is that this church will always be a Zadok priesthood. We're not very popular. We don't have many people. But you know what? The one thing that we got against in this church, and we want to hold on to is the presence of God because not everybody has it come on you know that you know the heart of the pastor you know I know your husband I know your church has the presence of God with you I witnessed that in my spirit it's not everywhere go it's not there they have the hype and the hullabaloo they know how to pump it up with the music Come on. They can dance and shout. They got the colored lights and the fog and the machines and all that stuff and the blackened altar and no cross and no, no pulpit. Come on, somebody. They're, they're approaching God's sanctuary for themselves. They're not doing it God's way. He said, you approach me, you approach my sanctuary, you do it my way. Amen? Let's all stand and close. And see, I tell you how to close now. Yeah. 
I want to be a part of the Zadok ministry. Maybe, maybe some, someone here, I don't know, maybe somebody here, you've been hungering for God. You've been desiring God, but you're saying, God, I don't know how, I don't know where. But I need God. I need Jesus. Tired of playing the game. My friend Joe and I, we've been friends for over 40 years. 47 maybe. We did a lot of crazy things together. Okay. We know what it's like out there in the street. We played the game. We came to the conclusion that we'll never be able to win the game until we met Jesus. Let's everyone pray right now. Is there anyone here who say, Pastor, I want Jesus. I want Jesus in my life. Because you never know. They could be backslidden people right in church. They need to recommit their life to Christ. Anyone here? Say, Pastor, I want Jesus. I thought I had him. But it was really full of me. It was full of me, not full of God. I was full of what I wanted to do and where I wanted to go and do the things that I wanted to do. God bless you for that hand back there. I'm going to ask somebody to take her baby and I want to ask you, come on down here, Let here. God bless you. You mean business with God? This is it, right? No turning back. It's a miracle. Just lift your hands up to the Lord. Repeat this prayer from your heart. If you don't, if you don't say it from your heart, it's not gonna mean anything. this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, you know everything I'm going through and everything I've gone through. And Lord, I'm asking you now to come into my heart. No reservations. I'm not holding back anything. Take my life. Forgive me of my sins. I believe that you raised Christ Jesus from the dead to save my soul, to justify me before your eyes. I receive your spirit into my life right now. And I thank you for washing me, for cleansing me, and most of all for loving me. Jesus name I'm going to pray for you Father so many hurtful words have been spoken over this person in their life many years of heartache and sorrow that she just buried deep within her heart and sometimes because of those hurts she reacts sometimes she says things and does things that's not pleasing in your sight but today, Lord, she laid it all out at the altar. Every hurt, every pain, every unkind word that's been spoken against her. And Father, we speak healing over her right now. From the crown of her head to the soles of her feet. Lord, you healed her spirit by reviving it again so she can commune with you. She's born again according to your word. Now, Father, do and continue to do the work seal it with the seal of the holy spirit that seed of that uncorruptible seed being born again of that uncorruptible seed let it grow and let it mature father give her the desire for your word and for the things of god and lord let the things of this world slowly and 
surely be falling off of her in the name of Jesus. What a hunger and thirst inside her soul. We thank you and we praise you for her in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a clap offering. The Bible says all the angels in heaven rejoice over one that truly repents. Amen. Does anyone else need prayer before we leave? Anyone else need prayer? Come on, Mama. God bless you. Amen. Lord, give you another 20 years. If we have that long. You ready? Amen. How old are you? 90. 90. A long walk. Amen. Praise the Lord. Saved since 74. I was saved in 78. So we're not too far behind you. And you never turned around. No? Oh, good. That's right. That's right. That's right. And if you didn't do that, we know you'd be in prison by now. Because you would have killed Stanley by now. <laughs> right. Amen. What a testimony, huh? Lord Jesus, we just pray that you bless Mama today. Father, from the crown of her head to the soles of her feet. Father, bring healing to any part of her body in the name of Jesus. And Lord, she's got a mouth that will speak the glories of God and speak the gospel of Jesus Christ. Wherever she goes, she talks about you, Lord. And I pray, God, that that will never cease. And God, you'll always give her a testimony. You'll always give her a word. And I thank you for her and Stanley's life, God. And I pray that you bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Anyone else before we close in prayer? <laughs> Oh, I guess a 90-year-old told you, huh? <laughs> All right. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Yes. It's a good testimony. The wife and I went to Grange Tree Mall. I got scared. I went by jumps. I wasn't even dressed up. This hit me. The man sat right next door to me in Virginia. We're having our breakfast up there. He hasn't been to church for 20 years. Was he Spanish and Portuguese? He had an operation on his shoulder. He said, When you walk by, brother, I felt something out of you. That's what the church needs. They need to feel God out of you. Hello? We're going so much, we got to feel God. He brought up breakfast, and he gave me a big bill. He says, take my mom with them. The man of God is telling you, you better get the Holy Ghost in you. Otherwise, the church is going down. Pastor Bob is right. Don't play with God. Don't send money out there either. Thank God. Right here, he's the pastor. Hello? I know you all sending it out there. You're doing crazy stuff, but there's no answers coming in. Hello? There's nothing coming in. I can tell right now from the audience. You should be praising God and shouting the man's right. I'm out of Israel, and I see what's going on. The church has lost its power and the anointing, but you're giving, but you're not receiving. I can tell by looking at you. I'm just here. My friend Gabe, he owns two good car dealerships in Brockton. I didn't want to come. But he begged us to come this morning. I was going somewhere else, but I didn't want to say no to him. He's a beautiful man of God. He owns a car dealership, and he takes care of my cars every time something goes down. That's favor with God in man. Amen? So what that sister told you, the pastor's wife, get it together by next week. Amen? Everyone needs fully saved. He's ain't lying about that. Everyone don't have the Holy Ghost. That's true. I can see it myself. I love you all, and God bless you. Amen. Praise God. Hey, hi.
Don't you know what just happened? I said, honey, I got Jesus. I don't have any fear. I said, you need to get Jesus. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Amen. Sister, will you come and close us in prayer, please? No? You're a pastor's wife. You don't want to do that? I figure you're a pastor's wife. You always do it all the time. All right. Um, who can I choose? He doesn't, he, he doesn't want to. I don't force anybody. They say no. No, it's okay. Who wants to come? Who wants to close in prayer today? My church. Come on, somebody. Vicky, come on. Oh, Lord, we thank you for this day. We ask you, Lord, for your blessing upon your people. As we go our separate ways, Lord, I ask you, Lord, for your protection, Lord. I ask you, Lord, you continue to show us and to lead us, Lord. Put in our hearts a desire to read your word, to come into your presence daily, Father. I thank you, Lord, for the visitors here this morning, Father. I ask for the blood po uh, double portion of your blessing upon them, Lord Jesus. Lord, I ask you, Lord, as we go today, Lord, that we remember, Lord, the sacrifice that you did at the cross for us, Father. Lord, we thank you, we praise you for this day, Father. I ask for your blessing upon, Lord, a prayer tomorrow night and Wednesday Bible study, Father. Lord, as we go, Lord, let your peace be upon us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray and we thank you. Amen. Hallelujah.